Well, I ask unanimous consent that the Senate proceed to the immediate consideration of S-380. I ask unanimous consent that the bill be read a third time and passed. The motion to reconsider be laid upon the table and that any statements re relating to the bill appear at this point in the record. Madam President. Is there objection? Uh, Madam President, re reserving the right to object. Madam President, I uh, Madam President, reserving the right to object. Um, I, I want to work with the Senator from Ohio. Thank you, Madam President. I know that the Senator, the, the presiding officer, the junior senator from North Carolina, agrees with, wants to be part of the TAA extension. I, I, and I appreciate that, as the Senator Casey and as Senator McCain said, Senator Baucus. My, my, my problem is this. I want to work with Senator McCain on this. I want to make this work. I want to extend the Indian trade preferences. He and I worked this agreement out uh, with Senator Kyle and Senator Casey and others at the end of last year in the last two hours of session, I think. Senator McCain, I think that was the, the timeline right at the end. Um, we were able to extend all of this, but only six weeks. He wanted longer. I wanted longer. We couldn't get an agreement there. But I, I, he asked if it's not reasonable. Is, is, is it not reasonable just to, to extend the old TAA? And the old TAA started 50 years ago. It was a great program. It was bipartisan. It's always been that. Um, but it's not reasonable to do only the old TAA. There have been 150,000 workers who are eligible since the Recovery Act passed for the expanded TAA because they happen to have lost their jobs to countries that we didn't have a free trade agreement with. They weren't eligible under the old one. They're eligible under the new one. Or they happen to be service workers. They're, not, they're eligible under the new one, but not under the old one. So, Madam, Madam President, it's a situation where... Uh, because of things we do in this body, we pass a trade agreement, people lose their jobs. We have an obligation. I know people are focused on government spending, as we should be, and on the deficit, as we should be. But this is an action of the House and Senate. We pass tax policy here. We give tax breaks for companies that move overseas. Why don't we pay for this TAA with something like that? We could always do that. The point is that there are so many workers in this country that have lost their jobs, because of trade agreements, because of tax law and trade law, they should be eligible for getting some assistance so they can go back to, so they can get retrained and go back to work. We all know people in our states, in Arizona, and Nevada, and Oregon, and Texas, and West Virginia, and Ohio, where, where that's happened. The other thing that we need to extend is the health care tax credit. We know that literally thousands of workers, I can give you some examples real quick, 400 Americans in Arizona, 1,400 Americans in Georgia, mostly Delta workers, 6,800 Americans in Michigan, 9,200 Americans in Ohio, 68,000 Americans in, uh, scattered around every other state in this country. Because of the Recovery Act, the expansion of the health care tax credit, they, are, they would be able to continue to get their health care. So, Madam Pr President, with reluctance, I... I, I, I don't want to do this because I want to see the Andean trade preferences extended, so, but I, I am going to object, Madam President. Objection is heard. Madam President. Madam President. Okay. The Senator from Arizona. All I, can, all I can say is that to my friend from Ohio, we have deep sympathy for the plight of the citizens of Ohio who have been very hard hit in this economic uh, disaster that this nation has undergone in the last couple of years. And there has been enormous loss of jobs and income uh, on the part of the citizens of Ohio and particularly that part of the country. I would also argue that my home state of Arizona has suffered rather dramatically uh, as well. But does it really make sense to dramatically increase any program at this particular time. What we are already spending is a billion dollars a year. That seems to be a significant amount of money. And I would also point out that a lot of these training programs have drawn, have drawn scrutiny and even criticism from the, from the GAO. And this criticism has been really kind of uh, telling. In, in other words, it says in fiscal year 2009, nine federal agencies spent $18 billion to administer 47 programs, an increase of three programs and roughly $5 billion since they reported in, to, in 2003. 
So I don't think that you could see tangible benefits from the trade adjustment uh, assistance. But we are willing, I say to my friend from Ohio, to continue to support a billion dollar program per year for trade adjustment assistance when we are slashing vital programs to that people know are, are far, we're all having to make sacrifices. Can't my friend from Ohio be satisfied with a billion dollars for trade adjustment assistance? And again, I just want to say, we, we really do have problems in our hemisphere. We really do have the Brazilians striking out on a new and independent course. We have Venezuela, we have Nicaragua, we have Ecuador, Bolivia. We have these countries that are looking on us as either an adversary or an enemy, depending on which country you're talking about. So the message we're sending here, by not at least extending this agreement, I, I think it is a terrible one. And I would ask again that, that uh, my friend from Ohio would reconsider. I also want to say a word. The White House, the President of the United States and the White House should be weighing in on this. The President of the United States has said that he wants the Korea Free Trade Agreement and we want the, quote, Colombian and uh, uh, Panamanian Free Trade Agreement as well. Well, if they want that, shouldn't they want to extend the trade preferences that was negotiated by President Bush, extended under President Clinton? Shouldn't we want that? And Republican and Democrat Congresses alike. I, I've, I've, I've taken too much time with this body. I, again, I would ask my friend from Ohio to reconsider, negotiate, do whatever we can before we continue to send this terrible message to our friends in the hemisphere who have literally laid down their lives in the war against drugs, which we have felt is in the United States' vital national security interest. I thank, I, I yield the floor. President, Madam President. The Senator from Ohio. I ask unanimous consent for two minutes to make a, a motion uh, and make a few comments, but only two minutes. Without objection. Thank you, Madam President. I, I have great respect for the senior senator from Arizona. Uh, I want to find a way, I'll give him specific names of people who have benefited from the expansion of TAA, the expansion of health care tax credit. I brought to the floor one day a stack of literally 500 letters particularly from Georgia, Michigan, and Ohio, the states that have been hit the hardest, but some 300 and many people in Arizona, too, and other places who have benefited from the expansion of health care tax credit and the expansion of TAA. I, I, I offer to Senator McCain, if there's, other than the fact it does cost more money, I don't dispute that, but if we can work on what specific problems they have with individual parts of the expansion, and if there's a way of working out any kind of language they don't like, I'm, I'm very happy to do this, but I, I cannot, and I'm going to offer a UC request on TAA, on health care tax credit, and on Andean, because I agree with Senator McCain on the Andean trade preferences, but I can't walk off this floor. The reason I objected, Madam President, I can't walk off this floor having helped the workers in Ecuador in Colombia, but not having helped the workers in Toledo, in Cleveland, in Phoenix, in Charleston, West Virginia. So that's why I'm making this unanimous consent request, which will help in every one of these cases, the Indian Trade Preference, TAA, and Health Care Tax Credit. I ask, Madam President, unanimous consent, the Senate proceed to the immediate consideration of calendar number 11, H.R. 359, that a Brown substitute amendment also on behalf of Senators Hagan and Casey, which provides an 18-month extension for trade associate adjustment assistance and the Andean Trade Preferences Act be agreed to. The bill is amended, be read a third time and passed. The motions to reconsider be laid on the table with no intervening action or debate. Is there, is there objection? Deserving right to object. I certainly didn't want to get in too much into this debate because it, it, it's a bit diverting, but the fact is the GAO concluded, based on our survey of agency officials, we determined that only five of the 47 programs have had impact studies that assess whether the program is responsible for improved employment outcomes. The five impact studies generally found that the effects of participation were not consistent across programs, with only some 
demonstrating positive impacts that tended to be small, inconclusive, or restricted to short-term impacts. And we're talking about an additional $1.6 billion. We can't do that. And why in the world the senator from Ohio and other senators from his part of the country were satisfied for years with a TAA of roughly $1 billion and now are not satisfied with that uh, in these times of economic difficulties uh, confounds me. Uh, uh, this is a sad, sad day for our dear friends in Colombia and the, and the Andes who have sacrificed so much on our behalf. I, so I object. Objection is heard. Madam the, President. The Senator from West Virginia. I note the absence of a quorum. The clerk will call the roll. Mr. Akaka. Mr. Alexander.
Madam President. The Senator from Texas. Madam, Madam President, I suggest the absence of a quorum. The Senate's in a quorum I mean, call. I'm sorry, I ask unanimous consent that the quorum call be lifted. Without objection. Uh, I would ask consent that the cloture vote with respect to amendment number seven be vitiated. Further, that amendment number 93 be further modified with the changes that are at the desk. Is there objection? Without objection, so ordered. Uh, Madam President, I would um, say that we are ready for the vote on the amendment. I would ask for a vote on amendment, the amendment number 93 as modified. The question is on amendment number 93 as further modified. All those in favor say aye. aye. All those opposed say nay. The ayes appear to have it. The ayes do have it. The amendment is agreed to. Madam President. Uh, the question is on Inhofe number seven as amended. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All those opposed say nay. The ayes appear to have it. The ayes do have it. The amendment is agreed to. Madam President, uh, I would like to uh, ask the senator from Arizona uh, to engage in a colloquy with myself and Senator Rockefeller and any others who wish to speak within this colloquy uh, regarding uh, an issue that was not able to be resolved because of the time constraints. Um, I want to say that every stakeholder representing constituents all over America gave greatly to pass this amendment that will have, uh, in my opinion, a responsible relaxation of the perimeter rule at Washington National Airport. We can talk about the details, certainly, um, as we move forward, but uh, I, I think there was one major issue uh, left unresolved that I think deserves a colloquy so that we know what we have to do to finish this uh, process in conference before we adopt an FAA bill uh, that is a very important bill for our country. So uh, I would ask the Senator from Arizona to state his concerns about uh, the undone uh, part of this bill and uh, then we will open it for discussion. Madam President. Arizona. President, first of all, I would ask consent that the cloture vote on the underlying bill occur at 2 p.m. today. Is there objection? Without objection. Thank you. Just very briefly, uh, the Senator from Texas is correct. No one who was directly involved in these negotiations is pleased with the outcome. Some will say, well, that must be a pretty good outcome then. Um, one of the things that we were able to, that we did in order to enable us to come to an agreement is to defer a big issue. And that issue will have to be resolved in conference. It's the issue of how the additional uh, flights that are being allowed under this legislation will be allocated among the various air carriers. And ordinarily, an agency will make a decision based upon criteria that the Congress lays out in the underlying legislation. Otherwise, their decisions can be challenged as arbitrary and capricious. So it's up to us to devise what those standards are, but we were, we were not able to agree on them. And it's one of the things that we will have to try to come to an agreement uh, with each other about and then to articulate a, a position uh, with our House colleagues in a conference. Uh, this pertains both to the original or first year tranche and uh, as well to the second year tranche. And I hope that my colleagues and I can continue to work together in the spirit of cooperation to devise good criteria uh, so that uh, the last piece of this legislation can be put in place. Madam President. The Senator from West Virginia. Uh, I want to make a couple of observations. First of all, I apologize to all of our colleagues for having to postpone cloture and pre-cloture uh, votes. Um, but what has happened is that a number of folks have come in at the very last second and asked for changes. Uh, that's not usually the way committee business is done because we've been on this for a number of years. But we have to face the reality of uh, that fact, 
and we want to get closure and we want the bill to pass. So I would say to my friend from Arizona that I will work uh, with him and with whether it's GAO or DOT or whatever agency um, we, we decide to work with or both, which we can obviously do, and which is in the legislation. The GAO is, is automatic for any, any member um, that I will work to try and resolve his problem as best as I can. There are many problems wandering around, but the, the basis of the bill, the structure of the bill, the overall bill, is actually not just about slots. That's a relatively small part. It's been virtually all of the conversation and the debate. But the, as Senator Hutchinson has pointed out, um, you know, a new air traffic control system, airline safety, all kinds of other things are so predominantly important that um, we've had to proceed in this way, try to accommodate our colleagues, and that we will try to do. President? The Senator from Virginia. Madam President, let me thank the Chair and the Ranking Member for their leadership on this issue. As, as uh, along with my colleagues from Maryland, the airports that are most affected uh, by these changes, and we have worked in that spirit of compromise, echoing the, the Senator from Arizona. I don't think anyone's totally satisfied, but I want to particularly single out the, the Ranking Member and the Chair for their willingness as well to acknowledge to work on the issue that the effects of these additional flights going up from where the House position was or the Airports Authority original position was, was to make sure that particularly vis-a-vis -vis Dulles, the economic effects on this and that the question involving uh, potential shared debt service between the two airports, an issue that, again, we were not able to resolve, but I can appreciate the chair and the ranking member and their staff's willingness to continue to work on this as this bill goes into conference. It is very important that we get this bill passed and we get move, for, move forward on next gen and all the other very important parts of the FAA bill. Uh, Madam President. The Senator from Texas. Uh, Madam President, uh, I just want to say that there have been a lot of negotiations on this amendment, uh, but I do think we now have a breakthrough and a way forward um, to solve the unresolved issues and pass a very good FAA bill. In general, uh, the amendment does relax the perimeter rule with exemptions. Uh, there will be five new entrant um, capabilities, meaning new entrant meaning uh, air, airport, uh, excuse me, air carriers who uh, no, do not serve National Airport now at all. Uh, and limited incumbents that have uh, fewer flights from National Airport will get five new slots uh, that will be able to go outside of the 1,250-mile perimeter uh, that has been a um, standard restriction at National Airport. In addition, there will be seven uh, flights uh, that incumbent carriers can exchange from inside the perimeter to outside the perimeter. Now, I want to say that uh, earlier the senators from outside the perimeter, which is basically west of um, St. Louis or uh, Denver, uh, have wanted 75 new flights. Uh, they came down to 30. Uh, they came down to 21, and now we're at 16 that would be total because the last four would come uh, later, after a study has shown that there would not be uh, disruptions or congestion at National Airport. So I think that we have a very limited number of uh, flights that will be coming into National Airport, a total of 16. Uh, but of those 16, 11 are already flights that go in and out of National. So the disruption to Virginia, uh, thanks to the good work from the senators from Virginia and Maryland, uh, we'll have very little increase or disruption uh, of the national airport area. Uh, but in addition, I want to say that though the Western senators uh, 
negotiated down significantly from what they originally wanted. Uh, the senators from the Northwest also have wanted to have uh, the capability for more competition and more consumer access, and I agree with them, and I think they did a great job. Senator Wyden, Senator Cantwell, uh, Senator Merkley, Senator Murray uh, also had great concerns, along with the senators from Alaska, Senator, uh, the senators from Alaska, Senator Murkowski and Senator Begich. So they had concerns that we had to address and uh, the California senators most certainly have wanted more access uh, from California because that is a huge population base uh, that will now have better access to National Airport as well as Dulles. Um, so there, I think that is the outline of the amendment that we've just adopted and we're going to continue to work in conference. The House bill has five new entrance only. Uh, so we have 16, we have conversions, the House does not, so there will be a lot of talk uh, and a lot of input, but my goal is to have more competition, to have strengthened air carriers for our overall U.S. air competition, and to assure that the people west of the Mississippi River have access to National Airport and so I think we've made a good start here and um, I want to commend all of those who have been involved in a very delicate negotiation and I especially thank my chairman uh, Senator Rockefeller uh, of the Commerce Committee for uh, helping us to uh, get to this point that we could pass an FAA bill as has been mentioned we're on our 18th extension, short-term extension of the FAA, and if we're going to have the next generation of air traffic control system, a modernization of the air traffic control system, the safety requirements, we have to pass the underlying bill. So we've taken a major first step here. It's not the end by any means, but it is the uh, beginning of the end. As, and I would uh, recognize Senator Wyden, who was very much a part of Resurrecting from the dead, I would uh, say is not uh, too strong a term, uh, the amendment that would have gone by the wayside but for his persistence in uh, assuring that we could come to terms that would make no one happy but no one also truly unhappy. I want to yield to uh, the distinguished chairman uh, of the Commerce uh, Committee, and I would just ask unanimous consent to speak briefly after the chairman of the Commerce Committee has uh, spoken. Without objection. Yeah. The senator from West Virginia. I, I want to echo um, what Senator Hutchinson has just said. In, in the process of legislation, if you look at it logically, you do it over a period of years or two, or a number of months and that people get their amendments in. Um, that has not been the case here. On the other hand, one has to recognize that uh, people feel very strongly. And when senators feel very strongly, they have that right. And they have that right to try, therefore, to affect the legislation, even though it may be uh, at the very last moment. I think everybody is acting in good faith here. I appreciate very much the uh, Senator from Washington, uh, Maria Cantwell, because she has given up a lot and she's also uh, been very cooperative on all of this and she's going to be the new uh, subcommittee chair of aviation, which I look forward to and appreciate. Uh, I appreciate the leadership that uh, Senator Hutchinson and all other members, really, the Senator from Virginia, all those Senator from whose time I'm taking, Senator Wyden, uh, all have participated in trying to work this out. It is not a beautiful process, but it is one, I want to say to my colleagues throughout the Senate, that is solid and strong and, and needs to be voted for when that time comes. Because it's, uh, as I said, the slots are not the only issue. The other issues are huge, and they are resolved without any, any contentiousness at all. So uh, in that spirit of really thanking all who fought for what they have a right to uh, fight for, and uh, we've tried to respond as best as we could. And if no, nobody's entirely happy, that probably means it is a good bill, a good uh, approach. And uh, so I just want to thank everybody. And I yield the floor. Madam President. The Senator from Oregon. I appreciate the chance just to speak for a, a few minutes. And 
I particularly want to thank uh, Senator Hutchison and Senator Rockefeller and tell colleagues that last night at 10 o'clock after hours and hours worth of negotiation, I thought the prospect of working this out was absolutely gone. I thought once again the Senate would walk away from the idea of trying to come up with a way to have a more competitive market-oriented system in the aviation sector. Obviously, this is not all that needs to be done. But this issue of slots, I would say to colleagues and the folks who are listening, this is not about adding more gambling machines. This is about the right to land a plane. And certainly, much of our country, where you have crowded you know, airports, Folks are very concerned about this because this really relates to the business climate. It relates to the quality of life. And it's not just in my part of the country, but lots of others. So this morning, we still had three or four outstanding uh, issues. And a group of senators on a bipartisan basis got together. We were just a little ways uh, up here in the building and in good faith worked through a variety of issues. Issues to make sure that everybody was treated fairly in terms of scheduling. Issues to ensure fairness with respect to the new flights and to something uh, called uh, conversion, which essentially involves you know, taking the uh, short distance uh, flights and turning them into a long distance uh, flights. We still have some matters, obviously, that we're going to have to review with respect to studying this issue and ensuring that all airlines have equal access to the markets. This is a sensitive subject, particularly to folks here in uh, Virginia and uh, Maryland. So these are areas that are going to take uh, some additional uh, work, but I think with the new provisions that have been added, particularly to make sure that we would have the five new uh, round-trip flights uh, from Reagan uh, National, ensuring that uh, these new uh, slots would be intended for long distance, for out of perimeter. We have moved a long way to ensure that the United States Senate would go into conference on a bipartisan basis in a unified uh, fashion. And Madam President, I just want to take a particular a note of the extraordinary work done by Senator Cantwell, my colleague from the Pacific Northwest, because when you reach an agreement like this that has three or four provisions in effect that still were being thrashed through this morning, it only comes together when colleagues say they've got to find a way to get to some common ground and they can't simply go into a negotiation and have everything their way. Nobody, in my view, in these discussions moved more from the position that they were more, most interested in than Senator Cantwell. And Chairman Rockefeller has been a right to note that she will be the chair of the uh, subcommittee. I can assure colleagues that no one will do more to protect the consumer, protect competition, to protect the marketplace that we would like in the aviation sector than Senator Cantwell. And she was instrumental last night and this morning where we practically could have been fed intravenously and just stayed put and kept negotiating to get to the point where we had an agreement on these slots. And I do hope I referenced Chairman Rockefeller when uh, you were off uh, the floor, Mr. Chairman, that we can continue this kind of cooperation as we uh, have this bill pass, uh, pass the Senate and we go to a conference. There's a reason why we couldn't resolve the slots issue in the past, and that is despite efforts to come together, we just couldn't get senators to focus on these three or four outstanding issues that were dealt with this morning, the question about scheduling uh, priorities and the question of the additional slots when uh, the Department of Transportation said uh, there was an uh, argument 
with respect to why it advanced a competition. I think we've been fair uh, to the big markets under this agreement as well as the smaller markets. So as you go into the uh, uh, conference, I think the goodwill that came about as a result particularly of last night's efforts and this morning's uh, efforts and all the cooperation that you and Senator Hutchison ha have shown, you have been able to take an issue that was seen as absolutely impossible to resolve, even as of late last night, because I felt when I walked in this morning, we were just going to hang crepes on this question and possibly the whole uh, bill. I think now this bipartisan effort and goodwill shown by a lot of senators on both sides of the aisle, led by you and Senator Hutchison, is going to pay off. It's a very, very good start to an issue that isn't going to be resolved uh, today, but some of the principles that have been laid out today are going to make a huge difference. And I want to close again by saying that my colleague from the Pacific Northwest, Senator Cantwell, who I believe knows as much about aviation as anybody on the planet at, the, at this point, did an awful lot to bring people uh, together. I look forward to working with you as we go uh, to conference. Thank you for your cooperation. Look forward to talking about some additional, some additional issues that you know I care uh, a lot about. Uh, Oregon, but you have uh, made it possible for us to make an enormous amount of, of headway uh, today, and I look forward to working with you and Senator Hutchison in the days ahead. Ms. Madam President, Mr. President, I yield the floor. President. The Senator from Georgia. Thank you, Mr. President. In just a moment, I will ask the body for unanimous consent to adopt resolution, Senate Resolution 60, but before I do, I want to talk about the significance of this agreement that we've come to on this important resolution. Fifty years ago, Dwight Eisenhower signed into law what was known as the Real Estate Investment Trust legislation, creating what's now commonly called as REITs. REITs are where common shareholders can buy equity interest in a real estate investment trust and benefit from the income therefore. For years, only big business people and wealthy people could do that. By the creation of REITs, average Americans could make an investment and enjoy the returns on real estate. The law is very specific. It requires 95% of all income to the trust has to come from specified sources like dividends, rents, and other income. 75% of the income must come specifically from real estate, and 75% of the assets must be in real estate as well. It was a successful law from the beginning to the end, but quite frankly, nobody would have anticipated in 1960 what would happen in 1986. With the change of tax laws in America and the loss of passive loss as a deduction on real estate, commercial and investment real estate and multifamily real estate went in the tank. In fact, most properties that were valued at 80 or 90 percent loan to value became overvalued at 120, 30, or 40 percent. People were losing millions and millions of dollars in real estate investments basically went in the tank. But because REITs allowed investors to go to the capital markets to raise money, REITs were created to take over these assets, sell interest in these assets in the capital market, recapitalize the property, and in turn, create a viable investment. Quite frankly, Mr. President, the multifamily apartment industry, the shopping center industry, and a lot of the office building industry was saved in 1986 by the REITs. So I'm pleased to stand here today sharing the stage with Senator Mikulski, who's a co-sponsor of this resolution, recognizing the importance of real estate investment trust. In my own state, we have a number of them. Every state does. Cousins Properties Incorporated, Gables Residential Trust, Piedmont Office Realty Trust Incorporated, Post Properties Incorporated, Wells Investment Trust, and many others. All are today viable and alive because America's small investors and large can invest in real estate investment trust. And so with that being said, I'd like to ask a unanimous consent. I ask unanimous consent that the Senate now proceed to the consideration of Senate Resolution 60, which was submitted earlier today. The clerk will report the measure. S. Res. 60, recognizing the 50th anniversary of the date of enactment of the law that created real estate investment trusts and gave millions of Americans new investment opportunities that helped them build a solid foundation for retirement and has contributed to the overall strength of the economy of the United States. Without objection, the Senate will proceed to the measure. Mr. President, I ask unanimous consent that the resolution be agreed to, the preamble be agreed to, and the motion to be reconsidered be laid upon the table. Without objection.
And, Mr. President, I'd ask one further unanimous consent that the entirety of my remarks uh, be printed in the record as submitted. Without objection. And I yield uh, the floor and suggest the absence of a quorum. The clerk will call the roll. Mr. Akaka. Mr. Alexander.
The Senate is currently in a quorum call. Today, they continue work on a bill reauthorizing federal aviation administration programs. Meanwhile, over in the House, members voted today to extend three provisions of the Patriot Act and Intelligence Reform Bill that were due to expire next month. The bill extends the provisions for another three months. It passed in a vote of 279 to 143. Republicans overwhelmingly backed the extensions, while a majority of Democrats were opposed.
Senator from New